Good morning on time attendees. Um, thanks for um, being on time. Um, I've been advised to um, give it a few minutes um, before starting because um, I guess, um, yeah, it's all gathering. Thanks very much um, for attending this session. Um, okay. Hello, Charlie. Um, I will look at chat now and um, say hello. Um, while I'm talking, obviously, I need to talk. Um, but um, there will actually be pauses, and I hope I will then um, I will be able to allow enough pauses, um, whereby I will actually um, encourage the use of chat for some yes no responses. Um, to see about consensus. And um, if there's any questions um, before I start, I would like to ask everyone to um, look at the Q&A um, button, which is basically um, next to chat, because um, that's really um, the best place and that's where I will monitor um, strategically, I hope, um, for actual questions. And yes, there will be points for question. So, okay, I've given a few minutes and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, let's hope everyone can see my PowerPoint that's coming up. Well, I can see a very international audience. So that one. Hmm. It's not enabling, let me see. Try again. Okay, that one's there. So hopefully you can see my PowerPoint and I am actually going to start. So good morning again um, to this morning's, I guess, a post first session for um, educators. Um, so I am an educator, but um, my, let's say, language teaching days were basically when I was much younger. Um, now I'm, yes, an academic but um, primarily I'm invested in research to do with language sectors, even though I actually work um, in the School of Psychology at the University of Roehampton. And my most recently funded project um, is indeed Becoming Bilingual. And I'll explain that very soon. And it involves um, what we call funds of knowledge, which I'll also explain as exchanged between educators learners and also in this case leaders um, across different sectors and we'll see what kind of sectors they are and so these are basically the funders including those that funded the antecedent project um, which was actually called growing up bilingual which since last year became becoming bilingual so just very briefly about the previous project and that's because it really fed to this one and why I was primarily engaging um, cross-sector exchanges and also now somewhat older children than when I started. And so when I did Growing Up Bilingual, it was funded um, by Research Council um, through a PhD um, studentship that basically my PhD student has now graduated from very, very um, gladly. 
Um, and so we primarily looked at primary school age children at that point for um, three, four years. And we were only investigating so-called heritage bilinguals. So they carried a home language, a language that they use with the heritage com teach community in the UK. And it was in a way you could say as a psychological scientist, quite, um, I would say not so much hard science, but more mainly based on testing. So control testing and also standardized self-reporting of proficiency, but also testing of naming, comprehension and so forth. To basically look at bilingual children's cognitive and social outcomes like peer competence, identities, um, attention control and so forth. Very much tested things because of the age, but also because of the areas. However, I was sort of um, collaborating with a local partnership at that point. I was at East London at that point at another university. And New and Partnership for Complementary Education was active and it had an umbrella of actually quite a few beyond these um, institutions that basically took part, but also um, some of the local teachers because we we're comparing the complementary sector, which I'll explain, and I'm sure a lot of the attendees do know about them, but maybe in case some don't. And also bilingual children that were bilingual, but without the complementary education. So complementary education basically involves after school, after regular school hours tuition, or particularly weekend tuition, of heritage children about their community language and relatedly the culture. So some of these places actually could evolve from something pretty small. And this is actually a photo of my children's um, learning um, space, you could say. It actually was a lot bigger than that, but since COVID, a lot of schools actually had to contract or even had to close because of the difficulty in enrollment and funding. But ironically, that's actually the starting point of a lot of these kind of home-based, um, weekend-based um, learning spaces about children's home language, especially for second or further um, generations. The bigger ones can have you know, their um, own festive calendars. They do a lot of active parent-involving events or larger network-involving events. However, there's quite a lot of underrepresentation and also under acknowledgement, whereby a lot of mainstream educators actually don't know about them at all, including language teachers, including those that actually rent their own um, state schools or private schools to actually um, run such weekend um, um, tuition um, centers. So, one thing led to another because we were running Growing Up Bilingual and we also got more funding for engaging um, other stakeholders that are not within academia. We want to see what they made of the findings. And so um, we basically got some funding and we had a series of um, talks and seminars whereby we involved half academics, so researchers, lecturers, and half um, practitioners, we call them, because they include not just teachers, but also adult learners, um, uh, charity providers for um, EAL, including adult EAL, locally, nationally, some associations that also oversee, for example, complementary education. So first two are still quite primarily, you could say, academic findings related. But towards the end, very much so, we wanted to see what can we actually do about the growing up bilingual findings? Can we actually use it to kind of optimize development from what we started to piecemeal together to get to know a bit better? And then there was also follow on projects building that basically led on to um, becoming bilingual. And so this is in a nutshell how it happened because initially it was very much psychologically based, cognitive, yeah and also um, social psychological development, measured proficiency. But through our later public engagement that was tagged on, we realized really we were not really just, we were barely just touching the sides. 
which actually a lot of these other contexts, a lot of these other ideas and concepts very much encompass and also you could say cocoon the child's linguistic developments. Um, things such as, you know, linguistic status, um, early environment, the family policy of languages to their planet, um, and also have they been migrating, um, so on and so forth. And very importantly, you know, we started engaging educators more and more, and also associations that basically um, are affiliated with them. And so these are basically the ones that had um, participated in our um, series, all of those organizations, and also, of course, local schools would send their um, head teachers, but those complementary schools as well. And out of these, especially towards the end of the series, the two circle ones, especially in this case for my presentation here, um, the ALL, Association for Language Learning, had a big part in helping us recruit interested teachers and learners in our cross-sector exchange. And that's because it's an association which some of you may know actually um, offers a lot of, say, extracurricular you know, CPD, and also just interest groups, SIG, for, you know, regional interest and so on. And so there were big stakeholders. That's the starting point of becoming bilingual from growing up bilingual, because at this point, we know quite a bit about the younger children and also for the language that they're basically family determined that they should learn. But here we are quite interested in also learner agency. Um, and that's because at this point when children get older, they may start to depart slightly or make different choices about how way they want to engage with their own community. And also, are they actually interested in language? And so becoming bilingual is really about those still children, but secondary ages, who aren't already fluent in a certain target language. So they're learning in school. It could actually be complementary school because they're second or third generation, but they would like to be fluent in it. And importantly, because of our experience engaging um, the educators, the practitioners, we needed to really involve them in our research a lot more deeply. So unlike before, where we tested in a very standardized control way, we engaged them somewhat differently, where we actually ask them to visit each other. So there's a lick, you know, quite a lot of leg work for us, but also for them, especially bearing in mind the underrepresentation of the complementary sector in the kind of unstinting efforts that they have basically gone through, you know, using voluntary um, low paid time to basically make sure of the continuity of language and culture. And so, we deliberately involve cross-sector exchanges to basically see you know, what they think as commonalities and also differences in how they practice, how they see as limitations, how they make do, what they see as the future and so on. And so that's the first stage visiting each other, mutual visit. And the second stage, yes, they talk about what they've seen, talk about what they think about what they've seen and also in general. And for this presentation, we focus on common challenges and relatedly creative or what children and the teachers see as useful practices that may kind of override or make do with resources. These are so-called funds of knowledge because a lot of these are so-called taken for granted practices, building up into kind of a body of ideas, concepts, that they actually are practicing through their day-to-day -day work, their learning. And so these are called funds of knowledge because you know, they are things that can be collated and that's what we've been doing through research. Um, and eventually we're not quite there yet. We're kind of having some emerging suggestions and recommendations for um, practice in future and perhaps even more um, exchanges. And so another starting point is because we're enthused by the fact that when I looked at the literature, um, it happened before, including, yes, complementary and mainstream. But usually there were teachers that were very enthusiastic about boring ideas 
about just generally language teaching. And that basically went as far as observing and discussing between teachers. They did find very mutually beneficial results, but it's very, very, very important, um, especially when I mentioned about students' agency, why students give up, think about giving up, or why do some persevere with learning languages? Why are some students more interested in some languages than others? Because they're practice recipients. We cannot actually not involve them, um, considering you know they are such important stakeholders. Um, but also, as part of our sampling, we also ask for different experiences of teachers, including those that may have management duties, because it's important to look at a bigger picture goals, resources, constraints that they will have to work with, their vision of the institution and remits, so that perhaps they could lend some of these inside knowledge to make sense of some of the um, funds of knowledge. And therefore, actors, contents, and contexts for fruitful, meaningful exchange, and hopefully co-creation. So this is what we've been doing. Um, in terms of on the ground um, since late spring term through all of the summer term. Um, the project itself was actually bigger than so-called MFL, Modern Foreign Languages. It also involved um, adult English learners, so those that migrated later in life, except because apart from the fact that it wasn't so much cross-sector, purely based on um, the opting in institutions, but also because we still have more data to collect. And so, and also because of time limit in this presentation. But, you know, I want to be able to basically acknowledge them as well, because they are recruited through my local organization in Richmond. And in terms of what I'm presenting as the findings, these are drawn from um, schools from, let's say, three different sectors that are all of secondary ages, okay? So six schools, not that many, because they needed to opt op in. And you'll understand when I say lots of legwork. And so the six schools include three state secondaries, one independent school, um, and two complementary schools that actually teach Tamil. And they were primarily on the east side of London, um, due east, northeast, and southeast London in the um, outer boroughs. And the school children, that are basically learning MFLs, but basically focused on French, Spanish, and German. You could say the three, you know, the big three European languages. And um, yes, this complementary schools. There are two complementary schools, one that run on a, runs on a Sunday, one that runs on a Saturday. They're not affiliated with each other. In fact, they come from somewhat different communities from um, Southern India or another from Sri Lanka. And there are actually somewhat dialect differences as well. So even though we say those that are not yet fluent in the target language but want to be becoming bilingual, but because of the catchments that we had, well, the children themselves are probably at least exposed to already another language apart from English because of the diverse backgrounds in London. And so we have at least Bengali, Italian, Polish, Romanian, of course, Tamil background, because they're Tamil background, so some parents send them to Tamil school in the weekend. And so from these schools, we had eight teachers, including three that were, um, two were heads of um, MFL in the school, and also one was a head teacher of a complementary school that also taught at the higher levels. And um, 13 um, children aged 12 to 17. So we pair them, and it was primarily due to um, location and logistics, rather than because of any particular matching. Because however we pair them, no mainstream school that takes part basically teaches Tamil in where we where we are, and so any matching would have to be cross language anyway. And so we were not particularly bothered about that because we're more interested in broad. Um, commonalities, but also gross differences in um, learning and teaching matters that um, the children and the adults basically observe and discuss. And so four pairs, therefore four focus groups, 
and we had 20 interviews afterwards as well. Well, what we found important was that because when you have a focus group, including adults and children, even though they're older children here, yes, adults tend to speak more anyway, especially since the adults are the teachers. So having the interviews actually enable you know, the children to actually express a bit more things that they probably wouldn't have as much of a chance to detail during the focus group. Okay. This is actually our um, um, advert. At first glance, it may seem that was a very generous um, kind of reward. Um, it's funded by Research England. But when I said lots of leg work, those of you who are from, you know, Greater London, you probably know that even to go from, you know, northeast to southeast London, it could take more than an hour. And that's exactly what happened. And so you, you know, in order to actually do mutual observations, you have to factor in at least half a day, not more. And especially after the return visit, you know, of say school B visiting back to school A, then we had basically the focus group, all of our focus group here, um, were done in person, even though we also offered online. But all of those were done in person after the second the return visit. Um, some of the interviews were done also in person, but most were done online. At this point, especially secondary um, children were quite used to using things like Teams and Zoom and so on. And so, you know, in terms of the funding and the reward, it barely really just you know pay for their time. We also, of course, we 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 help them with the um, transport and any um, subsistence as well. Um, so some of them actually posted um, in public about their involvement. But here for good ethics, um, I basically basically um, darked out the um, other schools that you know might not you know, because I have anonymized data that might not actually have agreed, you know, for, for this. Um, but so as to see that it actually involved very, very diverse community. And um, in fact, this was taken, you know, in a um, secondary school that actually had a complementary school um, cited there. But then most of the children actually never knew that the complementary school had been there all that time for what, more than 20 years. And so even though, you know, not that many participants, you know, so six schools, you know, 20 participants that finished, but then that means, you know, six kind of um, half an hour to one hour of each meeting, getting as many pages of data. And so we were basically using software analysis um, to basically base that to find commonalities, variation, within commonalities as themes, okay? So that's what we call thematic analysis. For those that are in academia, you probably know about it, but we're trying to gather themes that reflect, in this case, commonalities, but also some reflected um, variations within commonalities. We'll see some of these and to um, put some context within it. So thing number one, because our focus was in challenges and potential solutions or good practices, useful creative practices and solutions. So when we're looking at challenges first, we ask the students, but also the teachers about you know, what made things particularly difficult and challenging to learn the language that they want to be fluent in. Um, <clears throat> In terms of analysis, we actually, in the end, split it up the two findings for students and teachers here, because we realized quite soon the focus was quite different between the two groups in this theme. For the students, um, they were very language focused. They were looking at, for example, the speech related challenges. So they describe several issues related to comprehension or production of speech in their, in their target language. So that they can be about where to put the accents, when reading aloud, um, understanding of what they call it very fast native speakers, um, how to create spontaneous speech, especially those that are going through the intermediate stage, 
to use the while using appropriate grammar and vocabulary while trying to sound natural. They find that pretty hard. Um, partly because they also mentioned that they have habituated to English. And another side to do with language related is literacy. So a few students describe specific challenges to do with spellings, word finding difficulties when writing or in certain written tasks such as translation that is needed in assessments. Um, some mentioned that you know, these difficulties are actually applicable to um, across languages, but others mentioned these as more so for a certain MFL because you know, you know some of them actually know the heritage language that they also study in a weekend, but they also, of course, have at least one um, modern European language that they do in school. Um, so let's look at some of these. And the final one that I present of this theme of the students, I still call it a blur because it's basically a stage or a period of time whereby they are going through roughly T stage four, when they find things really, really hard. When they find things, when, when a lot of students that the peers they observe as kind of wondering should they stop it there and then. So let's look at the first one, which is the speech related. I can only give you, you know, about one or two examples because of the time limit, but very welcome um, for you to get in touch with me after. Um, and that's because I'm also concurrently writing a report about this as well, um, as well as um, for publication. And so here's an example of a year nine on French. Um, they found the main difficulties to have been like spellings and they mentioned it's something to do with accents. Um, and they, as I said, compare that to English, which is their strongest language. And they say, because in English, they say they don't have any accent in English or ways to say different things. But of course, we, we know that to be not quite the case especially what, for the example that they give the ou or the, in French or the o, depending on also whether there's an accent on top. But then we do know that, you know, in English, the ou sound can be very, very inconsistent. But it's just that the students, you know, see it as something that they have basically taken for granted. And they found that to be um, something tricky that they're not used to, especially moving towards even key stage four. Now, in terms of the literacy related, something mentioned that it's to do with general writing, but then it's to do with particularly a language that doesn't share a script with English or European languages, even though they find oral, orally it's fine. And in fact, a lot of these children actually do their heritage language GCSE early. That's because you know, in spoken, they, they would be absolutely fine but they have found certain tasks not easy, such as translation, because often it's a language they use with the community, but in terms of actual translation written, that's not something that, that's done commonly by children growing up in this country. And so they tend to make a lot of mistakes in writing, and this, this is where the complementary schools do tend to actually focus a lot more on. Um, for some, it's due to cultural reasons, and that's because it's a gateway or access to um, learning about a religion, cultural way of life. But at the same time, they say, yeah, they also find writing Spanish difficult, but then they also find other stuff, including the oral side difficult as well. And so here for the other theme about what we mean by the intermediate blur, here is basically a child who was 17 in an independent school, which he actually said he felt very privileged for being in after having seen his counterparts in state schools. Nevertheless, when, rem when kind of reflecting on the so-called stage four GCSE level, when he talked about the intermediate blur, he said it's probably, you know, that part whereby you're stepping between learning a bit of conversation and then feeling more confident in using it fluently. And this is where he also saw peers and he himself or other languages he tried stop before that he called the big bridge. 
because he had good support in school, he could keep going in German and French, of what he would continue to be doing. Because they found the middle bit, you know, boring or harder. And some other children basically reflected on that part, not with fond memories, but a lot of lists of vocabularies, a lot of kind of um, practicing of different um, um, conjunctives, um, use of the different um, um, tenses that they found to be tedious. And but this is a very important bridge or gap, let's put it that way, to cross. Um, to get into you know, a more advanced stage, which, which this child is in. And so he called this middle bit like walking through water. And he actually said that because he himself is quite a technical person, he likes to do things thoroughly. He actually likes grammar, so he didn't mind it. He knows strategies of you know, going back to it, leaving it and returning, and that's how he coped. So find in another place we're looking at the teachers. So they're looking at not so much language related, but a lot of the contextually related things. And I'm gonna go into the contextual issue first, um, where they mentioned, um, well, firstly, it's about school rules or the way that they administer student choices, because some students can actually drop their languages starting from year 10. The knowledge that they're not gonna do it actually makes it tricky, especially in terms of management of behavior. So a lot of these are actually not so much to do with language teaching, more to do with managing the class, including those that are not interested, especially in the state sector. And then here is actually teacher X being mentioned about the school that whereby children can actually drop by year nine. So that means you've got two years where you actually need to seriously learn about, you know, the important things, you know, the middle bit that we know even keen students find hard. And so she found that that's rushed rather than loved. She actually felt that, you know, if we want children to, to do that well, the exposure had to be a lot earlier. And there's a consensus among, consensus among teachers that there's not enough key stage two exposure. And that may lead to, especially if children didn't start off being bilingual, they find certain tasks that otherwise already bilingual children were used to, to be harder, such as listening, which they have less control over. If she puts the listening on, like in this quote, it has a very negative impact. Even though it's not that demanding, it's not long. She says the students seem to reject it. And finally, is the freedom of practice that a lot of teacher finds that, you know, they want to put in a lot of ideas, interventions, but they may have to follow some protocol. By certain days or by certain weeks, they need to have done something. So in suggestion, they may make at the beginning of year if they may. And there are broader, you could say, institutional reasons, such as constant changes in the curriculum. You mean, you know, this is a very experienced teacher that said this is the fifth time she's tackling another version of GCSE and she's always been teaching French. And then they were using phonics, which she found um, to be helpful. Students did too. But then now they're introducing dictations and the kids were like, what are we doing? So, can I see where we are at? <clears throat> And I'm happy for you to pose questions at this point as well. Especially if you're a teacher or even if you're a learner, whether or you've been a learner, whether you agree or not, yes or no in chat. <clears throat> Just check Q&A as well. I welcome you to do that um, at a later point as well. No, that's fine. I'll keep moving on. Oh, oh thank you very much. So great. You can say no, that's fine. So theme two, you may have to speed up a little bit, but um, these are things that we probably all relate to whether we're teaching or learning 
or not actually just about how to just generally get used to language. But in a classroom in particular, and this is where I don't split the teachers and the students because they said pretty similar things, but just in very different ways. They found making interactive in competitive games really help. But also, of course, teachers actually say that hardly any students would say, I just want to learn French, want to learn French. But because you know they're interested in the country or the culture, and so it's a gateway to it. And so you have to make that link. It cannot be learned in a vacuum. And then there's quite a bit of variation here that I'll look into a bit more about high, nearly exclusive use of target language or not, or constantly switching. So why do students find that fun, you know, games and, you know, and com competition? They don't mind a competition as long as it's in teams, yeah, in different groups. They think they're not learning. That's what a teacher says. It's, it's a fair conception. She was talking about it in focus group. And she was telling them, you don't know how many times I've actually made you repeat vocabulary again and again. Actually, to give credits to the children, on reflection when they're being interviewed, they actually clearly articulated that what was actually happening. They realized they were learning by repetition. It's just that they went along because they wanted to keep going because the game was fun. And now linking to culture, if the lesson's about, so they've been observing a higher level um, French lesson and they realized, okay, this lesson is actually about the roles of women. It's actually a group of um, Spanish, Spanish students that watched it. Um, but because they they could actually work out what it was about. And I find that to be very important to link to the culture, especially when learning foreign language. Things like tongue twisters, jokes, idioms help you understand the language even more. And the sometimes, you know, things that you cannot translate directly to English, or well, that's, that's no point. And then on the other side, there's quite a bit of, I wouldn't say debate, but varying use of the target language. But often teachers do remark or would com commend each other on is if they do observe high use or almost exclusive use of the target language. So here is, is someone that basically observed a high class where they saw that in English, everything, everyone speaking English, as soon as they walked in the door, he noticed, the teacher noticed, you shall speak French or something like that. And the teacher walked into the room, everything was in French, including peer-to-peer -peer conversation. And so it seems that the expectation for the French classroom was very clear. But then there are instances whereby the teachers themselves actually said they found it quite useful or even important, such as when giving feedback. So this is a teacher that actually still speaks with, um, let's say, a um, broken accent. But then she actually said now she translates everything and anything in a group, even though other teachers actually complain. Um, they say they're thinking in English. Tamil, yes, they can speak and they write what they are learning. But if you want to make sure they understand the feedback, how to get better, they need to understand in the language they know best. And here's a teacher that's teaching high level French that says some things that are tricky or it may create more confusion or if it's actually the hard grammar, that middle bit. Or to build rapport, give praise or the opposite if she had a concern. She actually finds that, for example, you know, there's only so many times you can say bien, and, you know, it feels tokenistic to her. And also, as feedback from students, she finds that, oh dear, if she has a French Fridays, where if the students had to always get a French reply and she realized she must cover some grammar, it was really difficult to tackle that fully in French alone. So that's theme two, yes, no. And I'll observe the questions as well. <clears throat> Yep, thanks for the comments as well. Um, if you have questions, do use some um, Q&A, but thanks. But, oh, I should go back to that slide. Yeah. So, 
what else have you observed, experience? Thank you very much. We could see some rapport that those teachers that we saw were not alone. So at the end here, are basically the descriptions by the children, but then there are also um, practices that the teachers also vouch for. Some of these you probably use yourselves. And I use those also, because, you know, even though I don't teach languages, but I do help out in the weekend for my children's complementary school. Like the children call this an exo game. It's actually, you know, tic-tac-toe, you know, tic -tac isn't it? Um, I mean, if your language has some characters, that that's great. But it can also be something, you know, especially if you have interactive whiteboard, that's, you know, can be quite usefully integrated as well. And because the kids can get into groups of teams, and so it can get quite competitive, um, especially if there are rewards. And that's also the wink murderer, because you can repeat certain phrases that are commonly used. So, you know, some of these are basically given here, and there's a lot of repetition. Yeah, until the end, especially if the children are on board. That can be done even in key stage two. But as the teachers mentioned that, you know, especially in state education, the starting point has to be quite gentle. And so that's a lot of repeat of some key stage two as well. And here's basically a high level student that actually describes two different bits that they're related to the same past teacher about a basketball tournament. So if he doesn't like what he sees that day, that teacher, no basketball, no game, no treat. But then he has a way of basically, you know, slotting the kids into the same team through the year and then learning of vocabulary, learning of grammar, they get this right, they can have a ball game. Obviously they're, they're using a foreign ball, not, not like this. And then if they do actually get a sequence right, they also would, you know, win a certain um, game and then they would also get rewards, which to them is basically sweets. So it still works in secondary. And then they can get into other types of game whereby that would encourage um, high to exclusive use of French or the target language. You know, if it's caught that they are using English, anglais, 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 and basically you, they don't lose a point, but then you gain a point. So rewards they like. Other things that basically a, you could say veteran teacher that is basically now in the management of um, association of language learning that helped us a lot in recruiting interest for this project, had looked at our data and actually interviewed her separately because she observed something else. She observed the adult group uh, because that's logistics. But because of what she saw in the data, she said, have you thought about this? Because of the middle bit that children find hard or where they give up. Since they do fall back on English, what about those that, you know, actually use where they actually can fall back on? Use that as a link, use that as a strength, such as books that they actually knew very well, maybe since case stage one, that are actually quite popular in foreign languages, including for foreign language speakers in France, in Germany, and so on. Even some translated into non-alphabetic languages. So we trolled through some of these with the teachers and we found, actually, why not? In fact, the Gruffalo actually has been tried out and which is why I put that out here. Um, there's actually a small group of schools that actually managed to, do, to get um, um, Donaldson to basically um, had a one day um, treat of the schools to basically look at the Gruffalo in different languages um, among the primary students actually. So maybe potential for those that are basically still trying to grasp, you know, grammar, you know, vocabulary, because they know these stories well. And in fact, one of the teachers actually said, well, we actually use these for, um, not, not these, but the, the sort of ideas. We asked the children, you know, the, the kids, what would you like? Some of them actually volunteer that, well, maybe we can watch Peppa Pig in French or Spanish because we used to, you know, know it very well. So in some, these are basically a recap of what we see from, you know, students, teachers side, 
and what everybody finds in common. And this is where we'd like to take stock of what we do have and what can be applied. Are there opportunities for that? So I know I started about five minutes in, so we have a little bit of time. Um, I'm happy to, I'm not sure I can let people unmute or unmute you, but um, if you have questions, please, or even at this point, comments do um, use the Q&A. But um, I would very, very much welcome um, very, very quick feedback as well, because I only just got all the results um, analyzed, and there's still probably more to draw through more deeply. And so let me know, you know, what you think. Are you in agreement of, you know, with these observations and descriptions and commentaries and evaluations of um, the children and the teachers? Um, so that's where I will stop. <clears throat> If you'd like to um, do the tick boxes after the session, I'm very happy for you to just screenshot yeah, screenshot this um, QR and do that on your phone or device later. Thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat> I conflicted over target language use. Yes, there, I can tell you there's no consensus among the teachers. I mean, they appreciate high use. And even those that use it almost exclusively, so that's a teacher from the Tamil school, we could probably hear up to 10% of English use because you know the children speak it at home. But then to make sure the children understand what they need to do for homework or assessment, um, they actually do use English as well. Um, they have quite special function, they say, if they do fall back, they say fall back or revert to English. I can empathize with that. Do stress talking to a foreign learn, okay, yep. Maximalist. Um, yeah, some agreement about overloading of the um, curriculum. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I should have said yes. The more agreement, the higher, please. Yeah. I should fix that now, actually. But um, thanks very much for asking. Yeah. <clears throat>
may not show in your interface if you've already entered the um, survey. But thanks very much for entering the survey if you have um, the 10 tick boxes. Um, so it is the higher score, the more agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no more questions or comments, but thanks very much for those that participate. Um, I hope um, some of the information was um, interesting or useful. So have a lovely rest of the morning and weekend. Bye, everyone.